Hey, everyone. My name is Harrison Wheeler, host of the Technically Speaking podcast. And my guest really doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Today, I have Maurice Cherry, a creative strategist, designer, podcaster, and just all around legend in the design world. Fun fact, he was actually his Revision Path podcast is the first podcast I was actually ever a guest on. So it's my pleasure to have you and an honor to have you on the show today. How's it going, Maurice? Pretty good. That's a great intro. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah, yeah, man. So why don't you give everyone just like a, a brief introduction about yourself for, for the listeners that, that don't know? Yeah, sure. Like Harrison said, my name is Maurice Cherry. I'm a creative strategist. I'm currently working uh, for a tech startup that's based out of Amsterdam called Code Sandbox. Most people know me for Revision Path, which is my weekly podcast where I interview Black designers, developers, and digital creatives from all over the world. I've been doing that now for about eight years. Actually, as we're recording, this is the week that our 400th episode uh, is airing, which is awesome. And yeah, I'm a designer. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a HBCU grad. I went to Morehouse College. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Amazing. Amazing. So as you, you, you mentioned, you released your 400th episode, which is a huge milestone. Um, what are some lessons and reflections that you have just looking back at it? Looking back at the show or just as like podcasting in general? Look at, looking back at the show. Okay. I would certainly say looking back at the show, I can chart the the progress that I've made, not just as a podcaster, but also as an interviewer, like as I go back and listen to old episodes, for example, because what I've started doing is going back through the archives mm. and re-inviting people back on the show just as an update. Yeah, And I can listen back to those old interviews and I cringe because I'm like, oh, <laughs> I should have asked this question better or we should have paced this a little better or something like that. So definitely I can see my improvement there. Yeah. Also, I would say I can see the improvement just technically, like the way that the show flows, the way it's structured, the way it sounds mm. has improved. And really, I would say the biggest thing is the variety of guests. You don't get to, to 400 episodes by just interviewing the same type of person week after week. I've been fortunate to have been able to interview people, like I say, pretty much all over the world, throughout America, of course, through the Caribbean, through Europe. Africa, Asia, Australia, haven't gotten to South America yet, working on that though. But seeing how the industry has changed, seeing as how positions have changed, trends have changed, I think one of the biggest things that I can point out just right out is just how many more people have gotten into UX over right. the past five years. It's really been something, I would say probably a good majority, not a majority, maybe about a fifth of the people that have been on the show are yeah. UX folks. Like, it's wow. been a pretty big thing over the past few years. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I've had the pleasure of having a few of those also on the podcast as well. And also one of, the, one of the things in the same note of just reflections, you've had an extensive career in design. Maybe give us like your origin story specifically up to the moment that you decided you wanted to pursue uh, a path into design. Okay. So design had always been a hobby of mine that I never really initially thought could be a profession. I grew up in rural Alabama in a town called Selma, which most people know about from the civil rights movement. And I grew up in sort of the generation right after Bloody Sunday. So if people saw mm. Selma the movie, the generation right after that is the generation that I was born into and came to be out of. So there's not a lot of opportunity there in terms of, you know, design or tech or really anything. Selma, for the most part, is a is kind of a slaughterhouse town. We have a, a big pork plant there called Ziggler's and people either work at the factory or they, they work at the candy factory. It's all about like manual labor and trade and stuff. So mm. technology and design wasn't really uh, part of my world in that way. I have to credit my older brother. I have an older brother named Ernest, who's four years older than me. And he's the artist in the family. He mm. paints, he draws, he sculpts, he welds, he does a number of different things and a fantastic artist as well. And I sort of wanted to be like him in that way in terms of being able to create things. So I would probably say that he's my first sort of real introduction to design as a concept. And then once I started school and was introduced to computers, first like the, 
the Commodore 64, then the Apple IIe, and then moving on up, I started being introduced to how not necessarily design was a part of technology, but certainly coding. Like when I was in high school in the mid nineties, I mm. taught myself HTML and that was a way that I could start to tinker around with creating websites. Even yeah. earlier than that, when I was in like middle school and in, in elementary school, we would do little like graphics projects on the Apple IIe. This is how you make a rocket or something like that. I, at the time, that wasn't really called design. It was just computer graphics is what sure. they called it. And it didn't really round itself out into a, a design concept or curriculum for me, I would say probably until I went to college. Now, I mentioned going to Morehouse College. Uh, it's an HBCU. I started out there in computer science because I wanted to be a web. Prior to getting there, I would spend hours at my mom's uh, job. She worked as a as an educator at the computer lab there. I would spend hours just on the internet trying to reverse engineer web pages and figuring out, like yeah. teaching myself how to do all this. And so I thought that, oh, if I major in computer science, that means I can be a web designer. Keep in mind, this is 1999, there's no like real curriculum or anything. There's no general assembly. There's no treehouse right. for all this sort of stuff. So everyone's figuring it out on their own. And I remember my advisor explicitly telling me that if I wanted to be a web designer, that I should change my major because the internet is a fad. And that mm. if, if this is something that you really want to do, then we don't do that here. And so I did. I changed my major to math, which was my second choice, graduated with a degree in mathematics. And even... In my math curriculum, we did a lot of kind of 3D modeling and like 3D sketching of like conic solids and three-dimensional space and stuff like that, which is, <laughs> which again is not really designed, but it's teaching me these different aspects about perspective and, mm. and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, and then I graduated, I worked as a, honestly, I did just like a bunch of really crappy, like customer service jobs for a few years because I really couldn't get a job with a degree in math mm. back then. This is like the early 2000s. And this was also with me at the time I was at Morehouse. I also interned at NASA for two summers. I did one internship at Ames Research Center out in Moffett Field, California, right near San right, Jose across, right across the bay from me. Yeah. yeah. And then I did my second internship at Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. And when I was at Ames, I even got to do a little kind of web design work while I was there for the robotics education program. Yeah. And I think at that point, that's when I saw, that's when I was able to take these skills that I had been doing as a hobby and mm. actually put it towards something. It wasn't until several years after that I had gotten, I had almost gotten fired from a job, but I quit first. And in the months after that, I was like, this is the time for me to start to put myself out there as a designer. And so sure. we have a local alt weekly newspaper here in Atlanta called creative loafing. And I looked through the classifieds and I saw something where the Georgia world Congress center was looking for an electronic media specialist and the Georgia world Congress center. It's a multimodal campus here in Atlanta. That's comprised of the Congress center, which is a big three hall convention center, uh, Centennial Olympic Park, which most people know about from the 96 Olympics, mm -hmm. and the once a standing Georgia Dome, which was the stadium that's now been demolished. But I started there in, God, when was that? March of 2005. And okay. that was really like the start of my professional design career, because everything prior to that, I had just been doing as a hobby on my own. I was, you know, like going to Barnes and Noble and and getting those like the Photoshop magazines tips and tricks books yeah. yeah and the magazines and just like taking photos of them on my little like flip cam phone and then going back home and using my pirated copy of photoshop to try to yeah <laughs> to try to like hone my skills uh, yes <laughs> i can i can remember those days vividly <laughs> not yeah. sure if you're not sure if your computer's gonna make it out on the other side of it though oh there oh there were definitely a couple of times i downloaded a something with a, a wrong cracked file and now i've got a virus and i have uh. to reset everything or whatever but yeah that was the start of my kind of professional design career was working there at uh at the georgia world congress center as an electronic media specialist yeah is there like ever a moment you look back at that professor that was like don't do math you know, or excuse me don't do uh computer science do math is there ever a point where you're like what if i didn't go that or what if I like stayed the or stayed on the course moving into computers? I've thought about that because at the time uh, and, and a good friend of mine, he's still my best friend now, we sort of both started off on the exact same track. When we both got to Morehouse, they have this 
dual degree program that's in conjunction with Georgia Tech, where uh, you do three years at Morehouse, you do two years at Georgia Tech, Mm -hmm. and you graduate with a bachelor's and a master's degree. And so we both started off going that route. And he stuck with computer science. Now he's a, he's a professor at Ohio State University teaching computer mm. science. So I think if that were me, I probably would have ended up going off into the academia route. But the freedom that leaving that sort of program and going to math afforded me was that I, <laughs> and it's going to maybe sound, uh, it might sound weird to your audience, I don't know, but like it forced me from doing a major just to get a job into doing mm. a major for something that I actually liked. Right. So I really like math. I was a mathlete in high school. I have no shame in saying that. I was captain of the math club and really enjoyed it. But it's like, what kind of degree are you going to have majoring in math? And I remember really liking the character of Dwayne Wayne from a different world and seeing Mm. what he was doing as a computer programmer. And that, and I would say also influence from my parents and probably some from the the community as well. Oh, he's going to Morehouse. He's going to, he's always into these computers and blah, blah, blah. And so I I started off on that route and it just didn't, I took an intro to computer programming course. It was okay. Like I got it, but I just didn't like it. Right. And I was like, if it's going to be more of this, then I don't know if I really want to (laughs) continue with it. But then switching over to math, everything was fun. Like I really liked math and all the concepts I just picked up on them and it was fun. And I tell people now math really teaches you how to think. And there's concepts that I learned there about like how to structure proofs and things like that, that I've been able to Mm. use even as my career as a designer, when it came to creating prototypes or doing proposals, if I'm trying to win business or something like that. So it, it really teaches you how to be a like constructive critical thinker it's not just about addition and subtraction and numbers and letters and stuff for sure and by the way that's a very relevant kind of story at least to the audience i'd probably say majority of the guests that i've had on the show so far thematically they have chased their passion design has been adjacent to that and i think at least moving forward as you're starting to see folks really pivot into the industry It is a lot of that previous experience that they bring with them that does add that value to the work that they're doing. I just want to put that out there, uh, especially for our listeners that they're so involved in the curriculum and getting a job. It's just, it's more than that. You've got to understand where you're getting the fulfillment from. And I, I also knew that even with having this math degree and having these skills that while I was working these rather kind of menial gigs after I graduated, In my mind, I always felt like, I know the next thing is coming later. Like, I'm too smart to be here. Mm. I know I'm going to be somewhere better. So let me just go ahead and pay my dues or or what have you. Just a saying that you, um, actually, no, I just forgot the saying. It completely blanked my mind. It was about sometimes how you have to, sometimes to get where you want to go, you have to do what you don't want to do or something like that. I don't know. It's something to that effect, but there were certainly some lean, I'll put it like this. There were some lean years post-college where I was like, I don't know what the next step is going to be. Yeah. And then I found this position at the Georgia World Congress Center and that really kick-started the rest of my design career from there. Yeah. In that moment though, were you how, like, how were you mentally? Were you just like freaking out? Were you confident that something was going to happen? Like, Maybe take us back to where you are then, because I know there's a lot of folks in between path just waiting for that opportunity. Yeah. And and I have to say now, back then, we're talking the years between 2003 and 2005. And so the Mm. web itself is already undertaking this big change from like web 1.0 to web 2.0. It's going to this point where it's trying to become much more, more social and more open. And even to that end, a lot of things that we take for granted now Mm. in 2021 as internet things back then were either extremely taboo or just haven't been done before. Like getting a job off the internet was a weird, (laughs) keep in mind, I got my first design job from a newspaper. So (laughs) so like like even the concept of, well, I'm going to apply for jobs online. What is, what is that? What does that mean? But I remember during that time, just being like, I wouldn't even say frustrated but just kind of confused like I didn't have any sort of mentorship back then I didn't have any sort of Mm. north star to look towards in terms of this is someone I can model my career after or anything like that let's see 2004 I was working at I was working for auto trader at the time 
And I was just like answering phones. I was in a big mm. cubicle farm, just answering phones about stuff, talking to car dealers about their inventory and stuff like that. And it was boring. Like I had to compartmentalize. Okay, work is just this thing that they pay me for eight hours. And then after that, I can focus on design stuff. Right. So what I would sometimes do after work is I mentioned going to Barnes and Noble. I'd go to Barnes and Noble, get some of those like dot net magazines yeah. or, you know, computer world magazines or yeah. whatever, those Photoshop tips and tricks books and just stay in there taking pictures and then go back home and try to recreate the stuff that mm. I'm doing just to one, get my skills up, but also try to build a portfolio right. because even doing that design stuff, like counteracted how soul crushing the telemarketing auto tradery stuff was it just it was a balance to that and so i would do that mm. until i'd go to bed and have to wake up and repeat that sort of thing so right yeah. I, I just remember being really frustrated because again this is at a time where the web is just not as prevalent of a thing as it is now people just are not as experienced in it and many of the folks that were doing this mm. when you look to other people in the industry they didn't look like you they weren't located in your city and you really had to, it was scrappy. Right. It was really scrappy. You ask older folks in the industry about the like web between 2000 and 2005, it was really scrappy. Just mm. trying to get in where you could. If you happen to be like in Silicon Valley or in New York or in one of these city centers that was really active and buzzing on the web, it was a lot easier to find opportunities. But if you're outside of that, like it's, it was rough. How would you say the sort of, scene in Atlanta has changed since you've been there? <laughs> I would say it's definitely gotten more focused towards startups. Atlanta has a really strong startup culture, whether it's the Atlanta Tech Village or the ATDC, which is the center down near Georgia Tech. There's a lot of entrepreneurship going around in the city. To that end, I think there's also a number of big forward-facing tech companies here. Facebook has an office here. Twitter has an office here. Google has an office here that I think 10 years ago, that wasn't the case for any of those companies. So right. you have companies that are moving to Georgia because they know that there's a big, there's a big pool of talent here. Right. One, the city I think has the most HBCUs out of any city in the country, probably in the world. But then you've also got heavy hitters like Emory, Georgia Tech, Georgia State. And Atlanta itself is a very kind of, um, it's a city for people that are transitioning. Like it's uh, People are really like coming in and out of the city. It's a nexus. It's a hub for that sort of stuff. There's always a huge pool of talent here. I would say now I feel like it skews more towards probably early career entry level than like mid to senior level in your career. Sure. But certainly I'd see, I've seen over the years how the startup community here has really blossomed. It's rare. And I would say this prior to the pandemic, like you mm. could go out to a different startup event every night of the week and talk to a new person, meet a new person, learn about a new gig, a new technology, something like that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of activity going on. And, and that's, you know, even rare considering how spread out Atlanta is. I think if you're in the city proper, it's probably a lot easier than if you're outside the perimeter. And many meetups, at least at the time, I know would have an ITP meetup and an OTP because people didn't want to drive 20, 30 miles to get into the city to try to meet up with folks. But yeah, definitely big on startups here. Really yeah. big. Yeah. So a little bit on the theme of kind of upstarts, startups. So Revision Path is your longest running project, but it's not your first. So I know you do, you're doing Recognize. You're also doing 28 Days of Web. And there's a few other that you've had. What is your general approach to how you commit to your work? So usually with projects, what I try to do is look and see where there is some type of a void that I feel like I can fill with a project of some sort. So mm. the one of the first big projects that I did was the Black Weblog Awards, which started like between 2004 and 2005. And that was because at the time, blogging was huge back then. Personal blogging was huge. And there were these awards events that kind of sprung up to recognize different, you know, bloggers back then. There were the bloggies, which were done by Nikolai Nolan. There were the actual, there was an actual different event called the Weblog Awards. But there were never any people of color that would get nominated or would win, certainly not any Black people. 
And so out of that void, because I knew so many Black people that were blogging prolifically, I created the Black Web Blog Awards. And I did that for seven years and then sold it off to a company. And they kept it going for a few years after that. Hmm. Even with something as non-tech as the Year of Tea, for example, which I started in 2015, I really like tea. I won't say I collect tea, but I am an avid tea drinker. And a lot of the tea-based media during that time was just very boring. Like it was long, it was poorly produced. It it always was wrapped in this weird layer of mysticism. I'm like, it's leaves and water. It's the second most drank <laughs> beverage in the world. Y'all are really making this out to be a lot more than it actually is. And so my thing with doing the year of tea was one, to give myself uh, sort of like a daily creative project. Sure. So for every day in the year, I reviewed a different tea Mm. And the reviews were less than five minutes. So it would be about the time it would take you to brew a fresh cup. And I would do loose leaf teas and bag teas and bottle teas and kombucha. And I would just try to do a pretty wide spectrum of teas to show just how approachable tea is. I would also include right. links to where people could buy it. And then companies, tea companies loved that. They loved how simple and straightforward it was. I had so many companies sending me tea. This one company actually sent me a physical, like, treasure chest full of tea i had to give most of it away because wow. i was like this is just too much too tea. much <laughs> but, yeah but yeah my projects do usually come out of seeing a void somewhere that i feel that i can contribute to and so that's how they come about yeah so clearly you were a an influencer before that became a thing is what i'm taking from your tea project <laughs> i mean yeah we can say that we'll say that <laughs> awesome i think one one of the I feel like one of the natural progressions of a lot of your pro projects have been highlighting Black designers from around the world. And I think back in 2015, you had a talk at uh, South by Southwest called Where Are the Black Designers, which in a lot of ways was a precursor to the big event that happened last year. Maybe take us through a high level summary of that talk, which anyone can YouTube later and, and watch themselves, but just give us a, a quick highlight of that talk. And then I'd also want to maybe get your perspective of where things are today from when you first presented the talk. Yeah, sure. So where are the Black designers came about initially in 2014, because once I started Revision Path and I was reaching out to people and interviewing folks, I started hearing from companies largely who were asking me that question. Hmm. Like they would say, oh, I heard about this podcast. We're trying to find black designers. We don't know where they are. Where are the black designers? And I'm thinking, if you found my show, then here's one place. But they want to find more places to really find black designers. And it's a testament to just how quickly things change in this industry. 2015 is what, like six, six seven years ago, something like that? Yeah. Six back, years. Yeah, like back then, the conversations around diversity and inclusion that we're having now really did not exist. They right. were just starting to they were just starting to happen. And when I say they're just starting to happen, that's not to say that they have never happened before in the history of this industry. They've mm -hmm. happened in kind of these cycles. I think now that you have these avenues such as podcasting or maybe even YouTube or something like that where people can really share their story in their own words, you start to hear from more and more people vocalizing this outside of say like an interview with a newspaper or a magazine or a website or something like that. Yeah. So I kept getting this question from people about where are the black designers? And around the time I had just uh, joined up with AIGA to become a member of their diversity and inclusion task force. And as this question was happening and as I was on that task force, that sort of inspired me to create uh, this presentation because while mm. I was at AIGA, that's when I first heard about the designer Cheryl Miller and started researching her life and her work and her 1985 thesis when she was at Pratt Institute that became this 1987 print article, which then became this 1990 AIGA working journal, which became this 1991 symposium. And so I'm seeing that like this work exists, it's in a continuum, like it's not just me getting this question from companies. This is a question that has been asked it's been around. for decades before yeah. me. And so my goal in doing that presentation was one, to show how this was a continuum building off of Cheryl's legacy of work, but then also giving 
some actionable items and steps that companies and people and organizations could take to find Black designers. I think it's one thing to point out the problem. And certainly back then, there was a lot <laughs> there was a lot of discussion, especially on Twitter, around people pointing out problems, but not necessarily offering solutions. Sure. And so what I wanted to do with this presentation was really offer a solution, not in a combative or argumentative way, but just clearly stating the facts. This is where math comes into play. Clearly stating the facts, like, I'm going to give you this proof of where Black designers are. Like, mm. here's the setup here's the like the corollaries and the theorems and all this stuff and this is the conclusion that we've worked out to get to that it's funny because when i did that presentation initially i mean it landed like a brick like nobody, nobody paid it was just quiet it. it was just quiet was it quiet because yeah. okay so south by southwest and and hopefully this will change in future years but back then yeah they put all the diversity programming in the furthest and highest up room in the convention center <laughs> for folks that live in Austin, it's nine ABC. They would put all of the diversity panels for the entire interactive track of South by Southwest in that room. So if you mm. went to anything, first of all, it was a trek to get there, but right. you had to stay there. Like it was very hard to leave and then come back to the main convention center hall because it just took so long to get there. Right. And so my, my talk was in nine ABC and in the room next to mine, there was a keynote by Jimmy Kimmel. He was giving a keynote on something. I don't know. So my room was like an overflow room in a way. Okay. Like the rooms, these are, are big rooms. Like the room probably could seat about a good 250 people comfortably. Yeah. And there were about like 10 or 15 people in there. People charging their phone. Some like a volunteer would pop in to take a nap or something like that. And like I had maybe like a smattering of six or seven people on the front row. Like it was very poorly attended. It was, it felt disrespectful, man. <laughs> uh. It was really poorly attended. But the people that were there were like folks from Facebook. There was someone there from sure. Dell, from Pinterest. That's where I first met a Forrest Young, who I think is the current, I think his current title is group creative director at Wolf Olin's, but that's where I first met him. So there were people there that like, at least saw the presentation. I saw the vision that I was trying to accomplish with that. And after that, I ended up getting invited to the Facebook house because companies come and they have a little house at South by Southwest. And mm. I got to hang out with a few people there and tell them what I was doing. And eventually yeah. from that, Facebook ended up becoming a sponsor of uh, Revision Path, which was great. But in terms of like the impact that the presentation had in the community back then, none I would say I wasn't getting really any, aside from the Facebook sponsorship, sure. I wasn't getting any emails or offers to talk or anything like that from that presentation. And I did end up giving it at other places. While I was in Austin, I mm. gave it at a few ad agencies there, most notably at uh, Sanders Wingo. I gave that same presentation again in 2016 here in Atlanta when they did the How Design Live Festival here. More people were there that time. And the the interesting thing about that particular event was that it was at the Georgia World Congress Center. So it was like this sort of full circle moment of me, like wow. I used to work here. And now 10 years later, I'm presenting here at a conference. Like it was wild, especially running into some of the same people and like old coworkers and stuff. It was interesting. But but yeah, the presentation itself, I don't think it really made an impact in the industry, mm. at least not in a way that got back to me personally. That's yeah. not to say that I don't think it had an impact on folks. And clearly it did. We right. saw last year this whole Where Are the Black Designers event and conference. So clearly it's influenced people. But at the time, no, mm. nothing from it. it. It really only started to get legs again. And I hate to say that it happened during this time, but it did. It was uh, right around this time last year when George Floyd was murdered. And, and somehow my presentation bubbled back up into people talking about it, but it was with much greater, it was amplified because yeah. of everything else that was going on in terms of social justice and highlighting black voices and such. And I would have people that say, oh, I just saw your presentation on YouTube and, and how can I give you some money? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that, that thing is five years old. All of those stats are probably changed by now, but like people were really clamoring over it and wanted an update. And I'm like, I guess I can give an update for it, which I did. I updated. Yeah. I did a second presentation at the AIGA design conference last year, just doing like a 2020 update on things. But then after that, I was like, you know what? I'm not talking about this anymore because one, these stats and this question and everything have been floating out here 
for years. And that's not to say that, oh, you should have heard it when it happened, but it's there. Go take it. I don't need to be the one to continue to rehash it. Like the fact that Mitzi Oku, who does Where Are the Black Designers, the fact that she's been picking this up and carrying the torch and asking the question to a new generation, to a new whole class of designers worldwide. I'm like, that's great. That's what you want to happen. You want the message to get out there more. So for for me personally, it's funny because people now will still ask me to do the presentation. And I'm like, it's on YouTube. Just play it. I don't need to give that presentation anymore. I think it was good enough to establish the fact that this is a thing and that it came about at a time, certainly when the optics around Black designers in the industry were starting to be noticed. You mentioned about one of the changes that I've seen in the industry with Revision Path. I've certainly seen a lot, like a lot more Black designers everywhere in the industry Mm. since I started. It was an Arctic tundra when I started Revision Path, and now it is so much more diversity in a lot of spaces. Like now it's really uncommon to find like an all white panel or something like that. Like black designers, or at least I do, I see black designers everywhere. So I think that's been a big change since the show. Yeah. And Maurice, all you can do is leave breadcrumbs, right? At desk, you've set your piece and it's now for others to, to pick up the mantle and run. Because the thread I would say between the 2015 presentation and the 2020 update is really about continuing the conversation in the community. Many of the methods and the destinations that I told people to go visit and stuff like that have not changed. Right. They're still there. And I would say now with social media, especially with like viral apps like TikTok and such like that, it's so much easier to tap into and create these communities than there were before. Like right. my presentation doesn't need to be that beacon anymore. I'm, I'm glad that people mm. still look to it as a reference. That's great. I'm glad that it's starting those conversations. Do I feel like I need to be the one to consistently like give that talk or everything? No, that's why I put them up on YouTube. So anybody can right. go listen to it. Have at it. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for providing your perspective and the story behind that as well. We're, we're starting to wrap up the show. What are some ways that people can learn more about you Vision Path, some of the other projects that you're working on? Sure. So there's my personal website, which is mauricecherry.com. That's M A U R I C E, and then cherry, like the fruit, C H E R Y.com. I update my website pretty regularly, although I need to do better about actually like putting a portfolio and stuff on there. But if people want to find Revision Path, it's just revisionpath.com, R E V I S I O N. P-A-T-H. We're also on Twitter and Instagram. Just search for Revision Path. And those are the the easiest ways that you can find me and to keep up with the show and what I'm working on. Awesome. And before we 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 end the show, is there anything that you want to leave with the audience that we didn't get to cover during the one thing really quickly, and I guess because I haven't really done like a huge public sort of thing around it, but I announced it on Twitter. You mentioned recognize at the top of the show. Uh, I actually made the the somewhat difficult decision this year to um, fold Recognize for the time being. What what Recognize is slash was as a design anthology that's made up of writings from indigenous designers and designers of color. It could be design commentary, design critique, et cetera. And I started it in 2019 after receiving the Stephen Heller Prize for Cultural Commentary from AIGA in 2018. Uh, for people that know Stephen Heller, he's a very prolific author, over 180 books, etc. And as a writer, like I really was a writer before I was a designer, I know the importance of writing as part of just your journey as a designer, like being able to write down your thoughts and and being able to share what it is that you're working on is very important. It can't just all be a visual kind of medium. And so I started the anthology with the the hope of really collecting a lot of writings from people. And we did very well the first year. We partnered with Envision through their Design Forward Fund and managed to put out an anthology of six pieces. The pandemic, I'm going to be completely honest, the pandemic kind of really killed the momentum Mm. for Recognize. 2020 happened. We didn't get as many submissions. I didn't have a job. And so I'm like, oh, how am I going to fund this now? I don't (laughs) like I got to keep a roof over my head. And I'm talking about paying out authors and stuff. And I would say this is this unfortunately continued over through into 2021. And as I really looked at what I want to 
focus on and work on with revision path. I made the decision to fold it. It may come back in the future in some sure. shape, form or fashion, but as of right now, it's not a thing. Like people had the opportunity to submit essays from February to May this year. And then I looked over what we had and really sat down and thought about it and was like, yeah, it's time to fold it for now. That's been one thing that I have, I've thought about in terms of what I want to impress upon your audience is just the importance of writing. I think it's super important for designers to know how to articulate their thought processes, whether that's a case study, whether that's just writing about their work, writing about their design thoughts, because it's really up to us. The fact that there are more Black designers out there really telling their story is one thing on social media. I think that's great. I want to I want to read more Black design books. So like, I know that we look to other big luminaries in the industry that have really done a lot around writing books and articles and things of that nature. But in terms of adding to that corpus of design history, like it's up to mm. us to be able to supply that. So I just want to impress upon designers to write more. Just start a blog, start writing about stuff. Thank you, Maurice. I know that ending the anthology around Recognize probably wasn't the easiest decision. I think one of the things that I really respect is your dedication and passion to elevating Black voices, Black designers around the world. And I'm happy that it is at least getting recognized for the listeners. I think it's important to understand that Maurice's Revision Path podcast is actually in the Smithsonian. Oh and yeah, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> yeah, see, we, we, didn't even, we didn't even get there. I was just saving, I was saving the best for last, right? Okay. But you can give us a, a little bit of a, a highlight to that because uh, it's now currently in the African American History Museum. Uh, in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. Tell the listeners a little bit about that and, and what that means in terms of just, or what you think that means in terms of advancing design in, in the Black community. Well, I think what is important about the being in the Smithsonian really is that it allows us to remain relevant. As a lot of us know just as designers, our work is very ephemeral. It can be written over, copied over, it's hard to even find a history of things that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, et cetera. And so the fact that the show, even in this current format, is in the Smithsonian, it just really means a lot to keep the conversation going. And also the fact that the to give the museum credit is that they made space for this. I've been to the museum. It's a great museum. But even as I went through like the basement all the way up to the fourth floor, I noticed that they had a lot of the black art and design shuttled off into a corner somewhere. It felt almost like it was under construction. And so I haven't been to the museum in a couple of years since then, so maybe that has changed. But just the fact that they've made space for it and allowing these conversations to live there is just, it's really something. Amazing. Look, I know that the, the conversation will continue even after this recording. I appreciate you being on the show. Always a pleasure. Again, thank you so much. Uh, for having me on your show. This was great.